We're going to be coming out of Ezekiel chapter 3 this morning. <coughs> we'll be in Ezekiel chapter 3. We'll start in verse 17 in the ESV version. I want to read this passage of scripture to you. But before we get started, I just wanted to I just wanted to say that I've been holding on to this message for at least a couple of months now. Um, I was good. The Lord woke me up one morning and he told me that he wanted me to preach on being a watchman. And um, so I knew that it was going to come out of Ezekiel 3. But I really prayed a lot and. I didn't want to rush it. I wanted to wait on the Lord and uh, put a lot of prayer into it. And then along the way, he, he did a couple of things that he didn't, he doesn't always do. You know, even the little vision things that he's been giving me and the words that he's been giving me, that's kind of like new in my walk. And he's given me a couple of dreams over the last couple of months. And I believe that the dreams coincide with, with the message that he wants spoken. And so the dreams will come. I want to mention the dreams towards the end of the message. But, uh, you know, before we get started, I just I just want you to know the title of the message is Judgment. He starts in his house. And I want you to know that we're, we're in the midst of a time in the world that we're living in that we've never seen before. No, I mean, I'm, times have been worse for people. Times have been worse for Christians yeah. uh, during the Roman Empire. Um, but I got to tell you that that same spirit is really, really ramping up. And uh, it's it's amazing to me the things that the Lord put in my heart. And I, we'll get into that more. But I just want you to know that this is a message of love, no matter how it seems. And, you know, one thing that I want to try to encourage the people in this church to understand is this. Is that I don't know where all of you guys are in your walk, right? I mean, really, I don't. You got to understand these things. I want you to understand my heart. I don't. I don't know where everybody is in their walk. I know some of you guys. I know that some of you really understand the word. Some of you really have been walking close with the Lord. Some of you guys love Jesus so much, right? And I, and I believe all of you love the Lord, or you wouldn't be in the house of God today. Um, but you really, I don't know as a pastor what each person's going got going on in their life. What, you, what you're dealing with and things of that nature. And so I just want you to try to be understanding that whenever I stand behind this desk right here, that I'm truly, honestly speaking what the Lord is putting on my heart, right? To, and I want to I want to hear from him and I want to speak for him. And, 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 and I need you to, I just want you to understand that. And I want you to, I'm asking you to pray. I think that there should be a partnership. Can I tell you that I've been praying for y'all? I pray for you. I pray for your families. I pray for your marriages. I pray for your children. Yes. Yes. And, I, and, I, and I'm asking you to pray. Let's be in a partnership yes. and you'll pray for me. Yes. And, and I pray for the word and I pray that the Lord gives me the word. Amen. Amen. So the title of the message this morning is Judgment. He begins with his house. Mm. Out of Ezekiel 3, 17 through 21. The Lord said to the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. But his blood... I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity. Another word for sin. But you will have delivered your soul. Again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin and his righteous deeds that he has done shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the righteous person not to sin and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning and you will have delivered and you will have delivered the soul. Father, you will have delivered your soul, Watchman. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, I need your help to speak what I believe you have placed on my heart, Lord. Your people need to hear your word, Lord, not the word of a man. 
I pray, Lord God, that you would speak from heaven, that you would prepare us, Lord God, to be receptive to your truth, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He said, he said, if you warn the, the sinner and if you warn the righteous and if they ignore you, then your hands are clear, preacher. And I've, have been, yeah, I've talked to this about this passage of scripture with many preachers through the years, not, not any recently. And one of the things that I kept hearing from preachers in the past was, <laughs> but that's Old Testament, Matt. That's Old Testament and that's not the context for today. And the whole time I'm feeling in my spirit but the God that I serve is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the God that I serve hates sin much as much as he, he did yesterday. He hates it the same amount that he hates it today. And I'm getting ahead of my nose, but I want to tell you, we get confused in the body of Christ when we start wondering that God's not the same. And, and, and that we start viewing his love from a different kind of perspective because let me tell you what, what we're thinking. He's not opening up the ground and swallowing people anymore. That's right. But I want to ask you a question because you know what? I think that many of us have had this conversation before. It's such a strange occurrence what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Right. Yeah. I'm not telling you I got the answer to that. But I, I know that there's people in this room that we've talked about. Why did the Lord do that? Why did the Lord just out of nowhere? Because he's not doing it to people today. People aren't telling the whole truth about their finances. They're not getting struck down like that today. And I'm telling you right now, I believe that, that we need to ponder the, the reality that maybe that was God saying, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're entering into a new covenant. You should be grateful and thankful for, the, for my love and my mercy and my long suffering. But you need to understand, I still hate sin to as much today as I ever did before. And I'm telling you right now, however you receive this message, the Lord wants you as his children to hear that he still hates sin and that he has made a way that you and I don't have have to live under the bondage of sin. I wasn't going to preach on this right now, but you need to understand that Jesus paid the price. Hallelujah. That he died to set you free. Amen. And that if you will believe in his finished work and hold on to it, that the power of the Holy Spirit will give you grace and strength and set you free from the bondage of evil. Amen. Praise God. The question is, will we believe it? Will our mind line up? Will it become renewed? And will it line up according to the scriptures? Can we believe God at his word? And that's really what much of my message is about this morning. The word of God. Yeah. Because you see, we're living in a world that's changing everything. Everything is changing around us, my friend. And the one thing that never changes is God. And he ne his word never changes. The grass will fade. The, the grass will wither. The flower will fade. The grass will wither. But the word of the Lord is going to stand forever. God's word is not changing. And you and I need to grab a hold of his word and we let, need to let it resonate on the inside of us and we need to let it truly become a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Amen. You know, warning a sinner is a little bit different than warning a believer because a, a sinner doesn't know. Right? I, you know, I used to get, I used to, once the Lord really got a hold of me, I was like, what do we expect? I mean, really, I mean, we, what do we expect a sinner to do? Sinner's sin. Right. They don't know any better. Yeah. Uh, and so it's different to warn a sinner because they need to know the truth. They need to be introduced to the truth. They need to have an opportunity to receive Christ. When it, when it comes to a believer, it's a little bit different. A righteous person needs to be warned because you need to understand something. You're still being tempted to rebel against God. Every day that you walk outside the doors of your house, the enemy or in the do inside the doors of your house, the enemy wants to tempt you to rebel against God. This world wants to get you to rebel against God. And, and, and what people don't realize is that when they, they we, we're taking we're taking the word of God in a complacent way now in the modern church. No, we are I'm telling you the truth. We, we just feel like it's not that big of a deal. He didn't really mean it when he said that. No, he meant it. And, and whenever we open up these doors, we, if we're not careful, suddenly our conscience becomes seared and we become complacent towards sin. That's one of the things that I want to talk to you about this morning. You know, I, I don't know, like, 
I got, I got this new thing that I got going on. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna warn you ahead of time about about washing away. What can wash? Away? I don't even know what song I want, but there's about five songs I was trying to think about about washing away sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But there's about five other ones, and I can't even think about them. But, 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 but could you, you hold on to the microphone, and when you get the right one in your heart, I want you to sing it to us. Okay. All right? Because but I want the people to know that, that you need to understand something, that I didn't say that Jesus doesn't wash away sin. As a matter of fact, Jesus, he washes away sin. And you need to understand that that whether you're a believer this morning or a sinner this morning, if you're a believer and you've fallen into a trap of sin and you don't know how you're going to get out, I'm here to tell you the blood of Jesus still washes away sin. Yes, yes. You got something yet? No, that's okay. Take your time. Whenever you're ready, we're going to go. I'm going to keep moving, but you're going to sing it. Because I need you to remember, because I'll be probably be preaching really hard by the time she finds the right song. <laughs> I did not say that it's not going to be okay, Christian. As a matter of fact, it's going to be better than okay. It's going to be fantastic. Hallelujah. If there's true repentance and a true turning to the word of God and the heart of God, it's going to be amazing. Freedom. Oh, freedom is a beautiful thing. Give me the freedom that you paid for, Lord. To where my heart is just solely connected to you all, where all I want is you. Yes, yes, yes. That's a good place to be. Because yes. all he wanted was you. Yes, amen. Amen. You were on his heart. You were on his mind. That's what God's speaking to my spirit Hallelujah. in this message. Warn them, son. You have not, they are not taking this seriously enough. Can you sing it for us, Oh, the blood of Jesus. Come on and sing with me. Oh, the blood of Jesus. And oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Say that next part. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. You know, this, this world has so radically changed since I was saved in 86. Everyone thinks for themselves now. <laughs> We've got so many preachers in our pocket, right? We've got so many different preachers speaking into our ears. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yep. And, and we all just and we all just got such great minds, right? And I'm not being facetious. We, so many of us are smart, especially in this church. We've got some smart Bible folk. Yeah, yeah. But we, and we all just think for ourselves now. And that sounds good on the surface, but let me just say this to some of you that are maybe new. There's a couple of scriptures that will help us clarify. Number one, the natural man cannot perceive the things of God. Amen. Yes. Because they're spiritually discerned. Amen. And you can be a Christian in the house of God and still be operating not from a spiritual right. mindset. Yes. As a matter of fact, whenever Paul spoke that, he spoke it to the church of Corinth. Amen. And he said, I could not feed you meat. I had to give you milk. Because you were still carnal. You weren't operating. Oh, but what are you talking about, Pastor Matt? They had all the gifts flowing in the church. They had gifts, but no fruit. Yes. They were full of division. They were operating in a natural mindset. Yes, yes. Then he says this in Romans chapter 1, and I know this is speaking of unbelievers. It says, because they knew not God. They glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but they, came, they became vain in their imaginations, their reasonings. Their reasonings, and because of that, their foolish heart was darkened. Yes. I'm here to tell you, we're living in a world where the world and all of their intellect, I've been having conversations with people left and right at these urgent cares and these places I work, and I was talking to somebody the other day, and this guy was just so smart. 
And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm, the more smart, we're, it's not helping. We're getting smarter. We're getting smarter and smarter, and the world is getting more and more wicked. Right. It's not getting better. Right. Darkened hearts in a never darkening world. The world says the Bible was written by men and believers say you're quoting out of the Old Testament. We're in a new covenant. God doesn't work that anymore. I'm here to tell you right now that it's God's mercy that he doesn't work there that way anymore. There's enough scripture in the New Testament that tells us that it warns us. Be careful, believer. Work, sir, walk circumspectly before your Lord. He says, you be holy for I am holy. And then I can hear y'all because I know y'all so, y'all know so much. Yeah, but he's my holiness. That's exactly right. But at some point in time, it's supposed to go from our spirit. And it's supposed to saturate our mind. And it's supposed to affect our members. Hallelujah. To where now we start walking in purity. We start walking in holiness by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That we begin to seek after the things of God and not after the things of the world. Yes. Romans chapter 2, verses Four through eight. Or do you presume? Many people are having presumptions. Look at this scripture, man. The ESV version that opened this up for me. Because, you know, we've been quoting this scripture for a while. It's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Well, let's look at the whole context. Or are we making presumptions? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and his forbearance? See, you're making a presumption is what he's saying. You're making a presumption based off of the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and his patience. But in, what you're missing is this. His forbearance, his patience, and his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Yes, yes. The whole purpose of it, the whole step, waiting, the whole long suffering, the whole stepping back and waiting and giving you another day and being long suffering and, and giving, I'm talking, because listen, I'm talking to people in the church too. Because I don't know each one of you. I don't, some of you could have secret lovers for all I know. Some of you could have something else going on in your life, but I'm here to tell you right now, my friend, we're taking a big chance and we cross the spiritual Jordan and we still got that stuff in our life, especially knowing that Jesus paid a price to get us free from that. Yeah, yeah. It's a presumption. It's a presumption. His kindness is meant to bring us to repentance. But look at this. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. <clears throat> when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, he will render to each one according to his works. I want you to see this part right here because it gets, look at verse 7. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory, <coughs> excuse me, and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. L look at that. He's saying that people that are living for him that, 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 that desire the things that he desires, they, through patience and living a life of well-doing by his grace, you can't do it on your own strength, they're seeking for something. They're, they're seeking for something. They're seeking for his, for his glory, his honor, and immortality. And for those people, he is going to reward them with eternal life. Amen. But look at verse 8. But for those who are self-seeking, who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Well, I'm tired of where you have me, Lord. I'm getting kind of tired of this situation. I'm not real happy anymore. I don't think I love this person anymore. I think I'm just going to move on and do my own thing. Lord, help us. He says, for those that are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. See, everybody's got a right to love. There will be wrath and fury. Yep. I didn't write it. He wrote it. You know, there's a scripture that talks about it's not as though God's world word had failed. He says, he says this, he says, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. 
Yes, yes. That's Amen. Right. I remember reading that a long time ago. And I felt like the Lord said, that not all that called himself Christian is Christian, and he was starting with me. <laughs> he said, it is through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned. Boy, there's a whole lot of spiritual stuff we could talk about. Because, see, Isaac is a child of the spirit. Ishmael is a child of the flesh. Yes, yes. Yep. Those that are led by the Spirit will be called the sons of God. Uh, yes, amen. Amen? And, and, and we can really get into that, but let's just keep moving. We've been talking about this scripture a lot out of Matthew 7. Not every Lord, Lord. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to even read the whole. Lord, Lord. And he says, I never knew you. Right? And I, and I want to really read the whole thing because a lot of us have been talking about it. We've been talking about it in Bible study. I've had conversations with people. And that's a powerful scripture because I agree. It says it. Says it I never knew you. Yep. The part that's concerning me, though, and I know I've said it to y'all many times already, is that they thought they knew him. Yes. And it, all the signs led to it. They were casting out devils. They were healing the sick. They had an amazing spiritual resume. And they thought that they knew him. And I don't know about you, but I'm telling you right now, I don't want anybody in this room to cross that threshold and to find out that we thought we were in and in reality we weren't. Now listen, if you're in, like Sister Tiff used to say, you're going to know that you know that you know because you know. Amen. Because the Holy Ghost lives in your heart. But listen, these people thought that they were in. And I'm just trying to say we need to be sober is all I'm trying to say. Look what it says right here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 20. And we'll just kind of move forward relatively rapidly. I, was, I used to do a little illustration, but I'm not going to take the time. Because see, the King James Version says in verse 13 to gird your loins. Gird the loins. Of, gird the loins of your mind. And I used to wrap that little thing around me. Because see, you know how the men would wear those kind of like they wore like a flowing garment. And so what it meant to gird your loins is they pull that thing from the back and they tuck it up through their, they cinch it up through their belt. <laughs> Almost like, okay, we, we get ready to do, we're ready for action now. We're about to need to take off running. We're about to get into something over here and I can't have all this stuff in my way. All right. And so we, 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 we ready for war. We're ready for what we got to deal with. But, we, but, but the ESV makes it easy on us. Prepare your minds for action. Be sober minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation yes. of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Yeah. There was a time before your life with Christ when you just didn't know any better. Right. And you used to just live according to your passions and according to your lusts. And you just didn't know any better. But once you're a child of God and the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, let me just say that that's how you really know when you get saved. When you really get saved, you've believed with your heart, you've confessed with your mouth, but the Holy Spirit moves in and he changes. Yes. Amen. He says, don't live that way, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. This is New Testament. He says, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, look at this. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now, why would the Lord want me to walk in fear? I, he delivered me from a spirit of fear. He has delivered you from the spirit of fear, my friend. He's talking about you being fear, having fear towards his holiness, reverence towards his holiness. And his righteousness. He's saying that in the ESV it says on your exile here. But other translations are saying while you're a stranger on your journey. Handle your business with fear during your journey. In other words, rem reminding yourself that you belong to God. And, and let, let me just go. Let me go to the next verse. Verse 18. This is why you're supposed to handle yourself with fear in this journey on earth, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways that you inherited for your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. 
<laughs> so what the Lord's been showing me, and he's starting with me. So if you're all exonerated, praise God. Maybe I'm just the only problem here. And I'll preach to myself, okay? So that all the weight's off of you, my friend. It's all on me. He's showing me, son, you hadn't been walking with a proper reverence and awe. I've, I've given you my word. And sometimes it's like you're treating it like I didn't really mean it. Mm. And I'm here to tell you that I really, really meant it. And that it's so important that you believe it. Yeah. And that not only do you believe it, but that you, that you grab a hold of the grace that I purchased for you. And you walk in it. It's so important because the enemy wants to destroy your walk. The enemy wants to deceive you. Yeah. House of God. And let me tell you something. Where did this is? I don't know how long this message is going to last. We need to keep going. But I got to tell you that we are in the midst of a mess, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. I'm telling you right now, there's victory for the saints, but what does victory look like? What did victory look like in the end for Peter? I'm going to, I got to say it. What did victory look like in the end for Peter? You might need to do some research. What did it look like for Paul? In American church, it got people, oh, yeah, but that was them. That, 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 that God wouldn't do that to them. What? <laughs> well, you know what, God? We, better, we, we need to pray, church. Yes. This nation is wicked. Yes. And the church hasn't been doing what they were supposed to do. We're just letting everything happen the way that it's happening, and we're acting like it's okay. You do you. YOLO, you only live once. Everybody's good. Come on. Help us, Lord. <laughs> the Lord said, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not from the Father, it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with his desires. But whoever does the will of God, yes. our body yes. friend. Yes. Come on, church. The world's trying to offer you some stuff. The world's trying to offer you some compromise and the enemy's trying to convince you it's going to be okay for you to take a little sip because you can always repent tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Help us, Lord. Jesus. Without the word, we cannot know God's will or how he thinks. And the question is, will we think like him? Yes. Out of Ephesians 5, he said, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. And that he gave himself up for her. He loved her sacrificially. He loved her selflessly. And, and, and this is why he did it. That he might sanctify her. You know what the word sanctify means? I, come on, y'all tell me. Because y'all the smartest church I know. Come on. Huh? Made holy. Come on, somebody else got another one. To be set apart. Made holy to be set apart. Yeah, how you was made holy? Because in Christ Jesus, he took you out of the world and he put you in Christ. He baptized you into the body and now you are the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And you are separated. If you are a true believer, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price with the precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. Hallelujah. And you're part of a bit. You don't do it you want to do anymore. Yes. You don't say what you want to say. Yeah. You don't roll like you want to roll, my yes. friend. Yes. You either in or you out. That's what the Word of God says. Yes. Well, preacher, why you got to say it like that? Because you need a crash course in Christianity. Yes. You need a crash course in Christianity. Hallelujah. Because it might take you a while to read through the book. Because yes. <laughs> some people don't even open the book. Oh, preacher, you had to go there. Yes, I did. Because you're not going to make it if you don't know the book, my friend. I'm not fussing at you. I love you. The word of God. The word of God is so important. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you want to be a believer, you do not belong to yourself. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. That he might cleanse her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Why does the Lord bathe his bride? Because he wants her to be without spot or blemish. He wants her. And listen, my favorite preacher will tell you, 
And that's how I've always preached it before. Yeah, but you're not going to really get rid of all your blemishes without Christ. I agree. I agree. I yield. I yield to the truth. All I'm trying to say is, if Paul said, how I travail till Christ be formed in me, and if the scriptures say that my lust must be crucified, that my flesh must be crucified, so that Christ can be formed in me, that the less of me there is, the more of him there is, that the world's going to see a better picture of Jesus, and that's the plan of God. Right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Warning for a departure from the faith, and this is where we are. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. This is 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. The Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. I'm trying to tell you right now, you need to be careful. Listen, you don't you don't listen to, to, who, to who I'm telling you to listen to. You can listen to whoever you want to listen to. Amen? I'm just letting you know that there are preachers out there whose consciences have been seared and they don't even know their consciences are seared. And they're, they're espousing all kinds of information and they present it in such a way because they really do want more people in their church. Uh-oh. And they want more money in the budget. Yes, yes. Mm. That's right. And they didn't even realize it, but they yielded and heeded to something in that. Because I got a question for you: Where do demons get a mouth from? Because it says it says that it, they give that by, they devote themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. In order for somebody to teach, there's got to be a mouth that speaks. Right. And he's saying that this is happening in the last days. I'm just trying to give. You, I'm just trying to warn you. I'm not here to tell you who's doing this and who's not doing this. I'm just reading. I'm just reading. You know, look, everything seems to be moving in a certain direction. And, and what it's saying is, no, you're fine. If you profess Jesus, you're good. A youth pastor told a girl that I used to know that before. She went to him for counsel because she felt convicted about something in her life. And his response to her was, oh, you're fine. And now she's married to a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to tell you that that's not okay. Mm -hmm. Because if a person feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their heart and in their life, then that means that they are to repent of their that's sin right. Right. and to get their heart right. right with God. But the spirit of Antichrist that's in the world is trying to convince us that we're all okay. It's going to be okay. See, it's the word of God that shows us the heart of our Father. And we must allow his word to speak to us. We must allow his word to have the last say so in our lives. The Apostle Paul told young Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Let me go ahead and give a definition for this word reprove for you real quick. Reprove, reprimand, rebuke. Hallelujah. Express sharp disapproval or criticism of someone because of their behavior. I don't like preachers like that. Well, sometimes I don't like them either because it reveals things that are in me that ain't right. Help us, Lord. Help us. And exhort. Strongly encourage or urge someone to do something. I strongly encourage you, I exhort you in the name of our Lord to grab a hold of his word, to let it speak to you and where you see that your heart is not lining up with it, that you would get along with your glorious father that loved you so much that he sent his son. And, I, and to, believe me, I want to do the same. Amen. He said, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Yes, yep. yes, yes. Endure means to put up with it. I'm not going to put up with it. I'm going to get up and go. <laughs> I'm walk out already. I'm going to get up and go. I'm not going to endure it. I refuse to endure it. Sound teaching, you know how I look up that word because I just felt led to look it up? It's hygienia. That's where we get the word hygiene. And I was thinking, you know, we, this, this church has had 
something consistent. We, we've had people that work in the dental field. Some people have moved on, but then the Lord sent a couple more. <laughs> my brother-in-law, my sister. My sister worked for two different dentists. And my brother-in-law's daddy was a dentist. And he was making teeth when he was 16 years old. And we got, we got another sister in here that works at a dentist office. And, and, and I've heard her talk about how important it is to floss teeth. And I remember one time I was talking to my sister daddy. She was like, but Matt, are you flossing? I don't know, I like to well, how many you got to floss? Well, Dr. Barlett has said you just floss all the ones you want to keep. <laughs> and so when you floss, you get rid of plaque. And when you get rid of plaque, it prevents inflammation of your gums. And you don't want inflammation in your gums because it causes all kind of trouble. So when it comes to this, so flossing is important for your dental hell hygiene. And, and the word of God is like floss for your heart. <laughs> The word of God, and you gotta endure sound teaching. Because it's gonna make your heart spiritually healthy yes. as you get, as you bring it to the Lord, because you don't want a bunch of accumulation of plaque in your heart. Yeah. Spiritual plaque. But they won't endure sound teaching because they're gonna have itchy ears, and the itchy ear really means tiny <laughs> pleasant words. And they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. So when I find a doctrine I like, I find a preacher I like that promotes that doctrine. I like this doctrine. I like that preacher. I like that doctrine. I like that preacher. I like that. And so now I've got me a, a heap of preachers that say the things that I want to say. But that preacher right there, he's a problem for me because he's coming against some of the stuff I like. Well, it's either the word of God or it's not. And I suggest that if it's not the word of God that you don't give him your time. That's right. That's right. Because he warned us in Matthew 24, false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. That's right. Now, now let me just say something about that word because we might we probably got a lot of different opinions about end time stuff right here. And I'm not getting into that because I'm not trying to even poke anybody right now about that. But that word elect, if you are a pre-tripper, my friend, the only way that works is if you're saying it's it for the Jews. And all I'm trying to say is that's a big chance to take. Because the word is not really used for Jews. The word, if you look up, it's, talking, it's always talking about believers. The elect. And, and, and he's saying that false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to the point that is drawn. See, people didn't want sound doctrine. They didn't want to endure sound doctrine, but they sure enough loved signs yes. and wonders. Yes, yes. Yes. Wow. They will seek after a sign and a wonder, and they don't even realize that they're doing it. The Bible says signs and wonders will follow them, so praise God for signs and wonders. Thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. Thank God for prophetic gifts. Thank God for healings. Thank God for deliverances. Thank God, Holy Spirit, have your way in your house. But Jesus said it. He said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a son. And he said, the only son I'm going to give you is the son of the, of the prophet Jonah. Yes, yes. Who was in the belly of a well three days and three nights. And I wonder if maybe when we get a hold of that sign a little bit better, we might see start seeing more signs and wonders. Amen. I don't know that we've gotten that sign right. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, maybe you have, but I, but when I look at the church as a whole, and even in our church, I'm telling you right now, no, we have not gotten a hold of that sign and that wonder in our hearts like we need to. I hope you still love me when we're done. <laughs> but if I could run you off that easy. All right, so I'm about to transition to some stuff, you know? We're about to approach some areas. Coming up soon, I believe, that we're battling in our society. And I want you to understand that the society of the Roman Empire, where Christianity was birthed, was contrary to the Christian faith. We've been living in the lap of luxury, my friend. America has been a paradise for Christianity. Sexual promiscuity was the norm of the land in the Roman Empire. The worship of multiple deities of choice was allowed as all, all you had to do was one thing. Sac make your sacrifice to the emperor. If you'll just bring your sacrifice to the emperor, everything else is okay. It, it, you know that there's literature that shows that some of the rich Christians would pay their servants to go offer a sacrifice to the emperor. 
I didn't think that that worked for the Lord. No, I mean, I'm not, I, I laugh, but that's not really a laugh in that. How do you think that that would work for the Lord? I'm a rich man. I'm not going to go offer my sacrifice to Nero, but I'm going to go ahead and get Onesimus, my servant. I'm going to let him go offer the sacrifice. All that's all they had to do. Because, see, this is what caused true Christians to be martyred. They refused to sacrifice to the emperor. And the ones that refused to be sacrificed to the emperor were thrown to the lions. Peter was crucified upside down. Thomas was run with, through with a sword. Paul was beheaded by Nero. And let's just talk about Nero for a second. He was famous for rolling Christians in pitch, a tarry petroleum product, and setting them on fire in order to illuminate the streets and other nighttime activities. That's, that's Christianity in the first century. I mean, I just wonder, like, Lord, help us. I, I mean, I throw a fit in my ankle yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So before we get a little too deep into what we're facing in society and with our government, let's consider the condition of what we call the church. And let me make this clear. Every last one of us in this room have in some way, shape, or form failed the Lord and fallen short of His glory. Can I get an amen? amen? We all have had times where we have had to repent for offending Him and treating His Word as though it were just another book instead of what it is, which is the Word of God. So while I'm not preaching sinless perfection, I am preaching sinful correction. The issue is not when people sin. That's not the issue. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Look, the problem arises with, hallelujah, thank you, sister. The problem arises when the people of God become so complacent with sin and with Jesus' blood smeared all over the place that their hearts are no longer broken over the fact that God's word is being ignored. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. You're probably not there, but I have been there. So I'm going to preach it. Uh, just this morning, Danielle woke up and said, boy, that Jehu, that was something. She was, must, that must have been the Bible reading this morning. I didn't have time to do it yet. I said, yeah, Jehu. He told them eunuchs, throw her out, Jezebel. Throw that old Jezebel out of that window and let the dogs lick her blood just like Elijah said. And then the next thing you know, and, and she said, and he turned the, what, the temple or into a latrine. I'm like, wow, I forgot to pass over that one. But then at the end of the chapter, and then Jehu did what all the other ones did. Turned his back on God. <clears throat> cheated on the Lord. I, my heart's broken for God. There's times in my life where it should have been more broken. You know what I'm getting at? I mean, no, really, if you read the Bible, you realize how much he loves us. You know what I'm saying? Y'all know God loves y'all, right? Y'all know that so much. And if you just keep seeing the story over and over and over again, what does people do to him? Yep. He's so long-suffering yeah. and so compassionate towards us. You know? And I just want to get to a place where I'm like, Lord, you paid such a high price, not just so that I could be with you for eternity, but so that I could have victory, Lord. I know that I'm not going to be perfect on this side of glory, but like Robert said the other day, I just want to be make sure I'm moving in the right direction, Lord. I don't want to be complacent in my yes. walk, and I, but I'm okay when, when the reality of my Lord help me. Yes. So before we get into the LGBTQ in the world, I got to tell you something. Now, the Lord gave me this message two months ago. I'm going to talk about that. Let me focus on a few things in the church. It's like we stepped into a time warp and we forgot that sin is sin, whether a person is a Christian or a non-Christian, as though Christians are exempt from sin because they're forgiven. Thieves and liars don't go to heaven, yet Christians cheat on their taxes and lie about it every year and act like it's okay because in their opinion, the government is corrupt. But Jesus said, not Caesar, Jesus said, whose inscription's on that coin? On that Caesar law. Well, good. Give Caesar what Caesar's and give the Lord what's the Lord's. Yeah. Yeah. I think the argument's over. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 
Jesus said it. And then sexual immorality is rampant in the church. People commit fornication and adultery to act like it's not that big of a deal. And the scripture says fornicators don't go to heaven. And since when did God say divorce was okay? And the only reason that I'm getting into all this stuff is because we're acting like it's not a big deal in the church. And all I'm, and listen, I know that there are people in this house right now that have gotten a divorce. And I know that they love God. And I know that they've repented for it. And, and guess what? It's under the blood and hallelujah. I'm just trying to make a point that what we're calling the church is acting like these things that we're facing are not a big deal. And Jesus said to those, to those Pharisees, he said, but Moses told us that we could give her a letter of the, a certificate of divorce. And you know what Jesus said? Yes, because of the hardness of your heart. Amen. Because of the hardness. People just do whatever they want to do. Yes. And then they say they're going to repent tomorrow. And it doesn't work that way. True repentance is going to hurt. Yes. True repentance means I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to just... Get rid of this one and go grab another one. When I'm preaching, come on now, I'm preaching to the preacher. I'm preaching because all of us have had our own issues in our own lives. And we need to stay true to the Word of God. Don't put words in my mouth, please. I understand there's forgiveness for fornication, adultery, lying, stealing, and divorce, but God help, help us. When preachers and people that call themselves Christians act like it's not a big deal. Yeah. And our hearts are no longer broken when we transgress His word. Churches are ordaining homosexuals and performing same sex marriages. Parents that raise their kids in the faith are going to kids' same sex weddings and condoning their kids, shacking up, and we're just all acting like it's okay, like it's not a big deal. Romans 132 says this, who knowing the judgment of God, and it's talking about this, you know what it's talking about? The spiraling down of society's morality. Yes, yes. It started off with their heart being dark, and then they thought that it'd be okay for a man to lie with a man and a woman to lie with a woman. And it got, that's how bad it got. Because it don't even make sense because you can't reproduce. See, God created everything with seed within itself so that it can reproduce after its own kind. It's a direct contradiction of the word of God. That's right. And it says in Romans 1 and 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. I didn't write that. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Yes, yes. We're living in the midst of a society where preachers like myself are going to be hated. Christians like yourselves, if you believe what I just said, you're going to be hated. That's right. Because there's a spirit of antichrist on the earth that's saying something different. And churches, and now listen, let me, let me be clear on this. If, if, if homosexual people come into the house of God, they should be able to be loved. Yes. And they ought to be able to have a preacher that's sensitive enough to know you ain't got a preacher on homosexuality on day one. Amen. But sooner or later, it's coming out. Amen. And the question is, how is it going to be handled? I don't know. Because you can't stay that way any more than a person can stay in an adulterous affair, yes. any more than yes. a person can stay in fornication or internet right. pornography. Amen. Amen. Right. First Peter 4, 17 through 19 says this, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? I've just been having a burden in my heart so much. I need y'all to understand. I don't know what I look like to you. Really, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how sometimes how I feel. I don't know how I sound. But I'm telling you right now, the Lord is burning it in my heart. You don't understand, son. And I keep telling y'all, and I think I'm con trying to convince myself as much as I'm trying to convince y'all, you don't understand. You're going to walk across the spiritual Jordan and you're going to look me in the eyes and there ain't no turning back. Yeah, mm. On that day, there is no turning back. And you're coming to meet me based upon what you believe the scripture said. <laughs> and yet you was disobeying it the whole time and giving yourself loopholes. 
I'm pretty sure I preached a message called loophole Christianity one time. Always look for a loophole. Hire a good enough accountant where you can find some loop, loopholes for your taxes, right? <laughs> now, that, that was, but I'm just trying to say in theology, too. We're over here. Yeah, but look, if you look at this scripture like that, yeah. Yep. So let me go ahead and get into you like a little bit of these dreams. The first dream was the one I told y'all where everybody thought they were going somewhere and nobody was really going anywhere. I kind of told the church about the dream. This was a few months ago. But the last scene in the dream. There was a whole bunch of people in the school bus. It kind of reminded me, like, if you've ever been to Homa for Mardi Gras season, they got their buses with the tops cut off of them, and they're riding around and they're playing, blaring their music, but it was just an old school bus. And it really one of the short buses, but it had a bunch of people on there, and they were fired up. They were fired up, and they were excited, and they all had big smiles on their face. They kind of looked like the people in the Superior Grill that I went to visit yesterday and laughed at. They all, they looked very similar to those people that were in there. And everybody was just excited. Music was blaring. <laughs> they were having fun. And then I woke up from the dream and the last thing I heard, hell is enlarging itself. I went to the scripture and it says in Isaiah chapter 5, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflames them. The harp, the vial, the tablet, and pipe, and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. They're not even thinking about God in their daily life. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Yes, yes. And their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled that the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Yes, yes. See, this world is so wicked, my friend. And now we're, we're on the world now, so you're, you're free. <laughs> Praise God. We're on the world now. This world is so wicked. <clears throat> try to get this one. Of course, it's not going to work. Oh, there we go. The world is so wicked, and they're just, they're just mocking the Lord, and they're just making fun of Him. And they're just doing their own thing, and they're acting like it's not really a big deal. They're laughing at people like you and I. Right? Y'all know what I'm about? The second dream, I've already shared some of it with y'all, was there was a, a solitary stalk of corn. And there was a woman with a bonnet on, and I couldn't see her face. And it was like the idea was times were tough. One stalk of corn, and there was snow all over the ground, and she had a dirt rake. And she was trying to remove the snow from off the ground. And when she moved it, and this is the thing, I don't dream like this. And it was so vivid and it was so clear. And, and whenever she removed the snow from off the ground, you could even see the grass was crystallized and interwoven. And it was hard. And it was like I realized that the, hard, the ground was hard and the ground was cold and that there was a famine. And what I knew, and somebody else already called it out when I said it the first time, it represented the heart of God. It represented the hearts of people. And it actually represented the heart of God's people because it actually was interconnected to, it was like a community. I could, I could sense it in the dream, even though the information wasn't there. It was a community of believers. And she's out there working, trying to get the, trying to get the soil condition conducive to, to the seed of God to, for, for there to be growth. And she's working and the ground's cold and the heart's cold. And the Lord gave me that scripture whenever I woke up from that strength in what remains. When he spoke to the church of Sardis in Revelation 3, you can go read the letter. But the last scene, and this is where I'm about to get into this. The last scene, it was still in the communion. It was on the outskirts of the town. And this was different. These, this, this was some younger people. They were, they were like probably in their mid-20s. And they were sitting there having a conversation. They were wearing normal clothes. She was wearing more like a bonnet with an old-timey old dress like you would have seen in the 1800s. 
They were dressed more normal like us. And, and, the, and the girl says to the guy, I ain't scared of no LGBTQ. Like real sassy like that. And the guy says, well, I think you need to think about that because they're still men. So you see in the dream, it's like, she's like, hmm, I'll, you know, I'll take them on. But I knew spiritually God was saying something. And God wanted me, this whole message was really about this, what I'm about to tell you. God wants me to tell you, and whoever will listen, that he's saying that he does not believe that his people are actually prepared. He does not believe that his people are prepared for what's coming. What I need you to understand is this, is that he is trying to tell us that we think that we understand, but the reality of it is, is that this is not gonna be fixed by a president. You need to understand what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not trying to beat up on any candidate, I'm not trying to tear one down and lift up another one. Doesn't have anything to do with that. The Lord wants you. I'm not trying to talk about a political party. So don't get mad at me. Don't, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm trying to tell you a president is not going to fix this. This is satanic. And, and I want to say a couple of things real quick. I believe this with all my heart. You don't have to agree with my theology. When God created this earth, he gave man dominion, power, and authority. There's times that I wish that I could forget the things that I learned about the occult world. I studied that stuff so deeply, wrote that book about it, and it's just so entrenched in my mind. I get tired of talking about it. As a matter of fact, I was working on some images in my met for my message yesterday. I said, you know what, Lord, I don't even want to show that. I don't want to talk about that anymore. And that was at 12 o'clock on Friday. And then they pulled their trick Friday night. And it's like the same exact stuff that the Lord had me working on. So you're going to see it along with me. Because the Lord wants you to understand that you are in the midst of a satanic battle. That's right. And he gave man authority and dominion upon the earth. And a free will. Yes. And whether you like what I'm about to tell you or not, I'm telling you, I this is what they believe, and I'm telling you what I know. That when God finds a believer like you, and, uh, and you say, yes, Lord, with my free will, I give you my heart, I give you my life, I will live for you alone. Now fill me up with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and use me on this earth. Use my mouth, use my feet, use my hands, and I'll cry out to you, God. I'll cry out to you in the midst of this wicked society, and I'll say, Lord, won't you make me look like Jesus? Lord, won't you use me? Lord, won't, you, won't you put something in my heart where I want to stay true to your word? Where, where I'll live like, like my Jesus, where I'll live my life for you alone, Lord. And his people just fallen by the wayside because the enemy's coming in and he's ravaging them with lies and deceit. They, it's like a Proverbs 7 situation where the man's walking down to her house. And he said, they don't even know they're going to her house. And they all end up in the pit of hell. And they don't even know until a dart strikes them in the liver. And the devil puts a liver shot on them and they don't even make it back. And it's happening to God's people left and right, left and right. Jesus. And, they're, and, they're, and they're intermingling themselves with the ways of the world. And they're acting like it's not a big deal. And it's offense to God. And so all that power, all that dominion, all that authority that he gave to you and I as physical creatures and should have been sons of Adam being recreated in the image and likeness of God whenever Adam was created that way. Instead, let me tell you what Satan's up to, my friend. And don't forget it because sometimes I use too many words. He's up to create people in his image and likeness. So we're about to get into that. The Lord completely opened my mind to all this stuff that yesterday. Revelation in a whole new way. And I believe it with everything that's in me. And God wants you to know what you're up against. And whenever people with their free will agree with God, power happens. Amen. Supernatural power happens. 
souls get saved. People are liberated from the bondage of sin. Physical healings take place. People are delivered from demonic presence. People are delivered. Oh, hallelujah. I'm talking about. And he said, if, if, if seeds of the gospel are planted in people's lives, those seeds are watered. Amen. Jesus is growing up inside of people's hearts. The gospel's being being sown. The, you, you get what I'm trying to say? The, the people are coming into the kingdom. We're working for the king. Behold, they say the harvest is four months, but I say, behold, the harvest is white. And in another spot, he says, pray for laborers. The harvest is ready, but pray for laborers. We're so busy. We're so busy in our lives. We're so consumed with our own lives. Yeah. And he's like, he, but if you belong to me, you're fine. You're okay. So what I'm telling you, what I learned that these people believe, they believe the same thing we believe. Do you believe what I just told you? That if you allow the Holy Spirit to use your vessel to live in you, and you pray God's will, and he moves, do you believe that when you sow the seed of the kingdom into a person's life, that you might not see it happen tomorrow, but do you believe that that seed is going to produce life? I know you do. Yes. Well, I got bad news for you, my friend, because they believe the same thing. That's right. They believe that if they take their free will and they use it for the other side, and this is what you got to understand. Satan believes he's going to win to begin with because he is the author of sin and he's already deceived and he thinks he's going to win. And his people think that they're going to win and he's, even though he kind of thinks he's going to win, he didn't read the end of the book, but he's trying his best he can to deceive as many as he can and bring as many with him. And when these people use their free will to do their incantations and their crazy satanic magic, guess what? It affects the world that we live in more than what we want to admit. I like, I'm, they got people that they, I mean, not that many people watch anyway, but some people got, they got to turn that off. How? He's giving the devil too much credit. No, you don't understand, sir. The church is sick. The church isn't doing what she's supposed to do. And the people of the enemy, they doing their business. And it's causing a shift. <laughs> and this is another thing I need you to understand. What is written is going to come to pass. Now, you might have differ on timing and this, that, and the other thing, and you might think that there's so many good people in America, it won't happen on your watch. I mean, I hope you're right. You might not think nothing can ever come your way. But, but what I'm trying to tell you is that it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And, and so, in the dream, when I woke up, I, the first thing I did was I Googled when was the first drag queen reading done? I had, I had to look. It was done in 2015, but there were some other things that happened in 2015. This, the Temple of Satan took a big old statue of Baphomet and went to Arkansas State Capitol because they had put the Ten Commandments up there and they planted it outside the Capitol. Yep. And what I, what I need you to understand is this, is that something really weird happens when they do these things that they do. It's kind of like they do everything in hidden secrecy. They do everything in the dark. It's always a riddle. It's always working backwards whenever because they don't want their deeds to be exposed. That's right. That's right. And so they're working in darkness, whereas we work in the light. Mm. But they believe that what they do works. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to kind of get into this a little bit. I want to just share this with you because I want to tell you a little bit about what I believe that the Lord is showing you. This is called Baffle Met. <laughs> and if you've never heard of it, and I, this is what I was not going to put into my message because I was like, you know what? I just don't even want to show this stupid stuff in the church. But I'm here to tell you right now, five hours later, they were they were doing all this garbage at the Olympics. And this has something to do with it. Yep. And so I realized because I wasn't even thinking about that from that when I was working on my message. That didn't hit me till Friday at noon. And I started downloading these pictures. Yep. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. And then all of a sudden people start texting me. Did you hear what happened? Yeah. All right. So what is Baphomet? Baphomet is a painting from a man named Levi Eliphaz. He was an occultist in 1850. Baphomet is going based off of something that happened with the Knights Templar. I covered that up because it was a little too weird. 
The Knights Templar, if you've ever heard of them, were in the 1300s. Yes. They supposedly were of the church. No, they were burned at the stake by Philip IV for worshiping a goat head That's right. called Baphomet. That's where it all started. They were burned at the stake. Yep. Levi Eliphaz was an occultist that painted this Baphomet picture. And the reason he painted it the way that he did, he, he said that the supreme being of the universe is androgynous, yep. meaning he's both. Okay, so he's got both, he's transgender, you could say. Yep. The word wasn't used back then, but the word, and, and this is what's crazy, because I stayed up till I don't even know what time, because it just started all downloading in me. Eliphaz Levi was learning, was just reproducing things that had been done in the past, the worship of Diana, the worship of Inanna, which is Ishtar, and that they actually would utilize, that they, that they believed in a God that was both. And that they would worship this God that was both. And that, that the word Lucifer also has a contradictory Lucifer. And that basically the liar is basically going, he's, he goes both ways. And whenever they worship him in this way, it gives him power. And I started to think, this is what they think his image is. And I'm not trying to say that this is going to be the image of the beast. I'm trying to make a point because I'm scared that I'm going to get it out and I forget that he's trying to create humans in his own image and in his own likeness. This is not politics, dude. This has been going on for thousands of years. And it's causing a shift in the world that we're living in. We are in a war. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to get worse. Right. They don't care what you think. And they're going to look, if, if I was a prominent person, they would be la they're laughing at right now because they laugh at this kind of stuff. And most LGBTQ people don't have a clue that this is what's going on. Any more than a homosexual person has a clue that these people worship the devil that way. They don't know that. They're just caught up in the, in the mess. Yeah. But that's what it is. And don't tell me it's not because I, I, I know it to be true. So this one here, they changed it up a little bit. But look, this is the, this is the one that the Satanic Temple has. And look how they got the children. Yep. That was in 2015. Also in 2015 was the first drag queen readings. Yep. See, see, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this isn't just, this is actually magic. I don't know if you can understand what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, 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 to teach you all this information in one moment. I'm trying to tell you that this is not political. This is, this is magic. Oh, no, the, the government's already got a document, that, and I have it in my phone, where, where they are purposely trying to get other nations to, in, to develop, to accept the LGBTQ thing. Yes, yes. All right, here you go. Him to Inanna. The goodness, the goddess in the hymn. Inanna was the Sumerian goddess of fertility, love, sensuality, procreation, and war. Later identified with Ishtar. This is going way back to the Canaanite religion when the children of Israel were first entering into the land. Her clergy were male, female, and transgender with the men and women frequently cross-dressing to embody Inanna's transformative powers. The androgyny of Inanna's clergy and adherence is referenced in the poem in line 121, where she is said to have the power to turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man. The central focus of the work, in fact, is Inanna's power of transformation, which can sometimes be seen as destructive or painful, but is always for a higher purpose. World History Encyclopedia, Hymn to Inanna. So I want you to see that this stuff's been going on. I want you to see that the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. And I want you to see that they're, they're wanting to destroy your children. Yeah. 
They're wanting to destroy you. They're wanting to destroy your mind. And they got a plan. And this plan is methodical. And everything that they do and all of these rituals is magic. And all I'm trying to ask you to do as my friends and as my brothers and sisters in the Lord and whoever you are that might watch is that we would become sober-minded and that we would ask the Lord to do a work in our heart and that we would fall to our knees or sit in our chair or do whatever we have to do and begin to cry out to the God of glory and to say, Lord, let your glory be filled this earth and Lord, prepare the hearts of your people that we would see that we, listen to me my friend, and you're not going to fix it in a voting booth is what I'm trying to tell you. Exactly. It's not that easy. I wish it was that easy because we, we're all going to go down there, right? We're going to pull our lever. And that's what they did, huh? Y'all heard the story? Yeah. Y'all heard the story. But the, the Snoop Dogg, they is Snoop. <laughs> it is his necklace. He got his Olympic shirt on, got his necklace. It's a bath of meth. That's right. It's a bath of meth. And see, that's what I'm trying to tell you. They ain't none of this stuff accidental. Oh, they gonna put you go to research. Because they're already fixing the story. Oh, but that's because he's wearing a goat, because goat stands for G period, O period, A period, T period, goat, greatest of all time. Snoop saying he's the, well, first of all, Snoop Dogg ain't the greatest rapper of all time, if there is such a thing. <laughs> Please. We're half of us don't even know what his song is. Why you want to pick on Snoop? I don't want to pick on Snoop. I wish Snoop would give his heart to the Lord and quit working for the devil. That's what I wish. Anyway, praise God. That's the last of that. I bet. Yeah, that was good. Thank you, Jesus. Now you can come up and play us some music. I know that this was a hard message. I didn't even I was like, Lord, I don't even know if I'm going to preach that message. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just, I just know that I, it, I feel like it's here, my friend. It's here. Yes. We're in the midst of it, and I don't think we're awakened. Is what I'm trying to say. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that none of y'all are awake. I'm saying we need to be stirred. Yes. yes. We need to be stirred to action. Every last one. Oh, praise God. He's so good to us. Yes. Amen.